and welcome back to Racing Rundown. Uh, this is our sort of continuation for uh, the Eclipse Award video that I put out uh, last week, and I mentioned that uh, we would be joined on Racing Rundown by Jay Privman, uh, and uh, so this is going to be sort of a roundtable type of thing, because Eric is also with us today for the first time. So uh, uh, once again, welcoming our friend Jay Privman back to Racing Rundown. appreciate uh, always getting the opportunity to speak with you. Jack, it's good to be with you, and good to be with Eric as well, so I'm looking forward to this. All right, so I guess we'll we'll start off with the the talking about the division that's kind of been the most contentious um, and one that I'm very interested to to get your full thoughts on. Uh, so, three year olds, obviously, uh, the two big main candidates uh, are Taba and Epicenter. So, I guess we'll start off by me asking you what your thoughts on the, the those two horses are because they each bring a very solid case to the table. I feel one way on uh, the epicenter Taba debate, but I did uh, concede a couple weeks ago that it is uh, a lot closer than I may have originally wanted it to be. So, or, or originally assessed it to be. So I, I'm curious your thoughts on that, that little debate there. Yeah, I, I'm, I think it is extremely close and I think you, you can't go wrong with either of them. I think they're both deserving and it's a shame one of them won't get it. Uh, you know, obviously epicenter was the best of the group for most of the year um you know the knock on him quote-unquote knock is that he only won one grade one that being the travers but to me beating uh 19 of 20 horses in the kentucky derby uh, and then running another strong second in the preakness both of which i think you could make legitimate cases he was the best horse in are are significant achievements even though they're not victories but you know, Taba won three grade one races. Uh, to me, winning the Santa Anita Derby and only the second start, only a, five weeks after a maiden sprint win, is a significant achievement, it, even if it turned out that the Santa Anita Derby field was not that strong as it turned out. But then he came back and ran big races in, in the Haskell, where he might have been best that day and, and got beat in a photo by Cyber Knife. He won the Pennsylvania Derby, ran a very good race, I thought, in the Breeders' Cup Classic in a race where nobody was beating Flightline, but he, he, he finished well to be third there and then won the Malibu, shortening back up. So there's a lot to like about both Colts. They ran against each other twice. Epicenter finished in front of Taba in the Kentucky Derby, and as we know, Epicenter was injured and suffered a career ending injury in the Breeders' Cup Classic in which Taba finished third. And we'll never know who would have finished in front of whom that day. Uh, so I, I really think you can make a case for either of them. I think Epicenter will win. He does have seem to have more support. And I do think it is between these two. I know Modern Games was the third uh, top vote getter in this division, but I f failed to grasp the campaign for him when you had two worthy horses like epicenter and Taba in this division and, and i would agree with with you jay on on the Taba winning the santa anita derby being so impressive and only his second start and i think when it comes to Taba, he only got better as the year went on whereas epicenter although he ran longer and ran more and um i would say definitely has a more impressive resume given what he did in the triple crown despite not winning um any triple crown races uh I still think that how Taba finished out the year was more impressive than Epicenter, of course, injury notwithstanding, um, winning two grade ones um, and a good third in the Classic. is certainly nothing to stop it. And so, Jay, I, I would love to pose to you in that case, um, how important is the whole body of work, um, and, and this can be in regards to any of division, how important is it in the whole body of work versus how they finished out the year, especially in a bigger race like the Breeders' Cup Classic? You know, it, it's hard to quantify. I mean, to me, they're both important. I, but I do think the overall body of work is, is significant. But I like to see horses that finish off the year well. And, and certainly a strong body of work accentuated by a big race in the Breeders' Cup is kind of the ideal campaign to be a champion. You know, we could look at, for instance, you know, there's other divisions we, we, we're going to get to, but I would just pull out of my hat Malathat. You know who traded in the older female dirt division all year was was trading blows with Clarier and and that race is going to prove pivotal I think in, in that division so I'm just using that as an example uh, uh, to to your question Eric but you know it, it's hard for me to say that one of those things is more important than the other though for me I probably lean slightly the overall body of work especially if a horse is built up 
a strong body of work and then they you know they just have a mulligan in the, in the breeders cup but i wouldn't just sort of discount the previous 10 months because of one performance um but it's got to be when you go go back and look at it it's it's got to hold up and and you know a horse that i think is an intriguing uh case study for 2022 in this regard is Jackie's warrior who didn't finish off the year. Well, had some big races earlier in the year, but when you kind of drill down as to what he was beating, you know, it doesn't really hold up. So that's, that's a real tough category and probably another one I'm sure we'll discuss. So there, there's, you know, it's it's hard to say that one's more important than the other. I, mean, I think they're both significant things that a voter rightly should weigh. And just uh, sort of taking at the aspect of looking ahead towards next year, Taba obviously finished out very strong. Uh, looking ahead to next year, what kind of races do you think um, are, are you expecting to see Taba put in next year? Well, he's going to go to the Mideast to, to begin the year. Um, his owner, Amir Zadan, uh, is from Saudi Arabia, You know, very much is interested in, in the Saudi Cup. Uh, he's also the co-owner of Country Grammar, the older horse who's staying in training for 2023. And so Tape is going to go to the Saudi Cup for sure. And then I would imagine based on how he runs there, perhaps he'd move on to the Dubai World Cup. So you're not going to see him race in the U.S. at least the first part of the year, but obviously he would have a, a proper campaign i would think in the u.s at, at the least the second half of the year and certainly being based at santa anita and with the breeders cup being at santa anita for 2023 that's going to be his main goal at the end of the year and um j- just one final uh question to wrap up uh with uh, wrap up this division with some of the other horses uh we mentioned cyber knife he'll have one more race uh in his career but there's obviously horses staying on uh into next year from the triple crown trails is there anyone that you're um looking at for next year t- um excited to see uh how they progress on it for you know it, it, it's really a, a division that's the bottom's going to come out of uh because uh, you know, Tabe is going to train on. Uh, you've got so many others who were leading lights in this division that has already been retired, like Modonigal and Jack Christopher and early voting. And as you mentioned, Cyberknife is going to just run in the Pegasus, and that'll be it for him. So there's there's really kind of a brain drain from this uh, group. Uh, you know, to me, the, the best of the ones that are remaining, in addition to Taba, would be Zandon, who I thought you know, showed some real flashes of, of high quality last year. And I'm looking to see if, if he continues to make progress, uh, at, at age four. I, I'm excited for both of those. And I think uh, rich strike, not, maybe not that he can progress, but seeing if he's going to continue this hit or miss kind of pattern he's been following. Uh, I think even losing both the classic and the Travers while disappointing, I'm sure not to get home there. I thought I thought backed up his Kentucky Derby run in a big way, but then of course we saw what happened in the Clark, where he lost to older horses who, while not terrible, still are horses you feel a Kentucky Derby winner in any other given year should be able to to run with. So I, I'm definitely very intrigued to see what he can do um, as he continues to face more older horses and obviously tries some new things next year. And, and with that, I think moving on to the Phillies. Uh, Nest is definitely a horse I think most of us are excited to see next year. And Jay, I'd love to hear any thoughts you have on her, seeing if she can continue her good form and obviously bounce back from a tough Breeders' Cup distaff. Yeah, I I think she's going to just keep continue to get better, uh, being by Kerwin, who got better as he got older. Uh, so she's going to be a horse who I think still has quite a bit of upside. And she's, uh, you know, a half sister to a a top grade one male himself. Uh, so, th- you know, this is a, a pedigree that would suggest that she would continue to get better. Secret Oath, who I, was the Kentucky Oaks winner and beat Nest that day. Nest, Nest had a better overall record. I think he'll be champion of the division, but Secret Oath stays in training uh, in that division as well. And so I think those are two you know, very good ones right off the start. Then you've got Society, who was brilliant in the cotillion and, 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 flopped in the Breeders' Cup distaff, but uh, is staying in uh, in training as well. So I think this has, even though we've we lost a lot of the good older mares uh, after their great 
campaigns that we saw in 2022 from the likes of, as we were talking about, uh, you know, with Clarier and Malathat, I think that division has a lot of new blood coming into it that's going to continue to make the older dirt Philly and Mare division quite strong in 2023. So now we'll move on to um, what is looking to be a very interesting um, Kentucky Derby trail. Um, and we have to talk about the uh, most likely champ- effective champion two-year-old right now. And that's in, in Forte. And Forte kind of was, was very interesting to me towards the end of last year. as He was always that horse that... Uh, at least for me, and I noticed from a lot of other people too, um, saying that, is this going to be the race where uh, it's going to come to a stop for Forte? Uh, and it never did happen, obviously, with the three straight uh, grade one wins that he had. Um, obviously, as I mentioned, very uh, most likely champion two-year-old at, at this point. But looking ahead toward the Kentucky Derby, how do you think Forte is going to progress on uh, into a campaign that uh, most likely begins in the Fountain of Youth at Gulfstream this year? Yeah, he's obviously the leader of the pack at the moment. But, and he should continue to, to do well, though, you know, Violence was a pretty precocious two-year-old uh, winning the Hollywood Futurity. That's his sire. So you would have expected Forte, based at least on his pedigree, to, to be kind of precocious, but he is out of a blame mare. And uh, we obviously know how good blame got as an older horse with his win in the Breeders' Cup Classic over Zenyatta. So there's parts of his pedigree that you would think show that he was supposed to be precocious, but there's other parts of it that say, you know what, it doesn't necessarily mean that he was going to be a good two-year-old who doesn't train on. So, and, and I like the way that he would finish off his races. He certainly wasn't hindered by going two turns, even though he had the kind of speed to win on debut going five eighths. So this is a, obviously one of the better horses, but he's going to need to improve because as we know from, from two to three, we get a lot of new blood that comes in and there's even a couple horses that he beat, uh, in the Breeders' Cup, who I'm sure are going to turn out to be good horses. Uh, you know, I think Cave Rock is a really good horse. Forte beat him on the square in the Breeders' Cup, but Cave Rock certainly ran a, a, a terrific race, I thought, in defeat that day. Uh, and then you've got all the, the usual cast of characters that are lightly raced and are going to be coming out of the woodwork uh, as we progress towards the Derby you know, with all the late developers. You know, Most notably would be a horse like... Arabian Knight, who won on debut Breeders' Cup weekend uh, at Keeneland. Uh, he's a, a really highly regarded uh, two-turning th- three that Bob Baffert trains uh, for the moment, though obviously he's going to have to, uh, if Arabian Knight is good enough to make it to the Kentucky Derby, he's going to have to move to another barn prior to the last round of point scoring races to get enough points to go on to the Derby. But we've seen this movie before in terms of the way horses like Teva and, and Messier were managed last year. In kind of building off, you mentioned two runners from the Bob Baffert barn, probably the, the unanimous top two in that barn. But we know there's others out there, horses like Faustin and Gilmore, both recent maiden winners who will probably take that similar progression um, as Arabian Knight. Uh, and then even this past weekend, we saw in the sham uh, reincarnate kind of upset, but then two horses with some good, great stakes experience and Newgate and National Treasure. And, and to me, when I look at this division out in California, it, it's definitely the hardest to get a good gauge on. Um, I'm generally pessimistic because when you have three or four horses from the same barn, it makes things a lot tougher to analyze, and you just feel they're, they're less battle-tested. Um, and I felt like we kind of saw that last year. Taba, he just wasn't seasoned enough to be a true derby contender, um, and we saw what happened the rest of the year, but uh, I think Messi is probably a better read when he won the Bob Lewis by so much. It, it still, you know, it, it came back to Biden, it felt like, in the Derby and maybe even since then. But then we go back to 2021, a horse like Medina Spirit wasn't running against the big fields, a lot of stable mates, um, but then goes out and, and does what he does in the rest of his career. So uh, I, I don't know if you have a general philosophy for calling them or if you have a good read on the few horses that ran this past weekend, but I'd love your thoughts on um, the, the state of the West Coast Derby horses as it stands. Yeah, I... I I would slightly disagree with your characterization. I think it was true in 2022. I don't believe it was quite so much in 2021. I mean, don't forget, Medina Spirit chased a a John Sandler cult named Rock Your World, and that's Sanity the Derby. Uh, And it was just a day where there was no passing, and I I thought Medina Spirit got a lot out of that race and and, uh, ran well on on Derby Day. And obviously, you know, what transpired afterwards resulted in his disqualification. But I, I think he was 
properly battle tested in that regard going into that race but it's it's an ongoing concern out here overall eric I, you know I, I think your macro point is 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 accurate because there's generally smaller fields in in california prep races and uh, you might not get as much out of these races and that's why to me it's always interesting to see which of these horses and, and it's usually bob baffert's because he's got so many candidates usually as we get into february and march it's interesting to me to see which ones go to oaklawn and how they perform down there because you're going to get a, a better test at least in terms of field size when you go to races like the rebel or the arkansas derby they just always draw bigger fields so those are that's just sort of the the overview of 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 how i look at it um in in terms of the the group out here i mean it really is just kind of all baffert all the time in terms of the top contenders right now uh or and or you know tim yakteen who might end up being you know the recipient of these horses you know he his his cult won the uh uh the los alamitos futurity um, so you've got, you, you've got a, a, a kind of, I think a finite group of horses at the moment that look like the, the better contenders out here. And they're all generally speaking Baffert or, 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 uh, Baffert adjacent. And, uh, we'll move on now to, uh, the, the two-year-old slash three-year-old Philly side of things. Obviously, uh, Wonder Wheel, kind of the same case as, uh, Forte consensus uh, champion two-year-old filly right now with her uh, pair of grade ones. She won a Keeneland, obviously Breeders' Cup uh, being one of those. Uh, and, you know, we'll, we'll segue into the Kentucky Oaks now and, you know, asking just with, in respect to Wonder Wheel. Uh, but in general, how, what's your read on the Oaks field uh, at this point, how the Oaks could potentially shape up uh, through this winter and into the spring? Yeah, I, I thought the Philly division for uh, among the two-year-olds at least the ones that were prominent enough to make it to the breeders cup we're just an average group uh i you know wonder wheels the deserving champion but i don't think she's going to scare anybody away uh who, who's looking to go down the kentucky oaks trail right now and there's just a lot of later developing types that i think are very intriguing in, including julia shining who won the demoiselle including out here in california faza who won the the Los Alamitos Starlet. I just think there's a lot of room here for, uh, especially late developing types, because based on the figures that these fillies were running at two, they're going to really need to step up their game at three to be still among the leaders based on where the, the, what it usually takes to win races like the Ashland or the Santa Anita Oaks or, or obviously the Kentucky Oaks. So I think, th- I think this is a little more of a, a jump ball right now than maybe the Colt division is in terms of knowing who's going to emerge by the first Friday in May as the top Oaks contenders. And I think that's pretty much where I, I and Eric would kind of gauge the, the two-year-old Phillies right now. Um, and there's not really a whole lot to, to get into with the with the next award. And since we didn't have a, a post-Breeders' Cup show with you, um, with, with talking about the older male, we just have to ask the formality because obviously we pretty much know what the answer is. But uh, what was your, uh, just your general thoughts that you had on Flightline and his performance that he had in the Breeders' Cup Classic and just what his brief but brilliant career, uh, where that stands up in terms of racing as a whole well it was obviously a brilliant career uh his performances every one was more spectacular than the other you know the met mile the, the connections of speaker's corner did everything they w- were supposed to to try and make it uncomfortable for him the first part of the race and he was just too much horse for them uh got outside and breezed home by six lengths comes back in the pacific classic and wins by nearly 20 lengths over the Dubai World Cup winner. Uh, and then in the Breeders' Cup, you know, chases a, a, a really hot pace set by a high-class horse like Life is Good and just blows right by him and, and goes on to win in, in a romp again. And to me, he just got better as the year went on, uh, and he was just brilliant in, in every one of those starts. Obviously, we would have loved to have seen him more. He was supposed to run, you guys might remember, in March, it's kind of a bridge between the Malibu in late December and the Met Mile. He was supposed to run at Santa Anita in the San Carlos, and they had a, a minor setback that caused him to miss that race, and so they just trained him up to the Met Mile, and he won so impressively. There was really no reason to jam other races into him other than the Pacific Classic or the Breeders' Cup Classic because you could see that he was kind of horse who really thrived on 
time between races and training into those races. He, he would run brilliant performances on that kind of management. You know, where he stacks up from a historical standpoint, it's just an impossible comparison to make. To me, he's the, the, the best horse that I've seen in my career over the 40 years that I, that I did this was spectacular bid. And, and to me, that's who Flightline most closely approximates. But, you know, how do you compare a horse who ran 30 times and won 26 over three years of campaigning with a horse who ran six times? It's impossible. So to, to say, like, well, who was better, spectacular bid or fly line? But, you know, if you ran them off the, their very best performances, just the one time, like, what's the best performance of flight line? What's the best performance of spectacular bid? I don't know who would win. But I have to give a horse like spectacular bid you know, far more credit for running as much as he did compared to fly line if you're looking at it from a historical standpoint. And, and with that, there, there is one horse I do want to ask you about because obviously we're trying to look at um, moving into next year. Uh, a horse who feels like he might be coming into his own, and uh, if he can find the right spots as the year progresses, um, could, could collect a lot of big checks, and, and that's Proxy, the Clark winner. Uh, any indication on what you think he could be as, once again, it seems like he's starting to finally figure things out after showing a lot of potential these last few years? Yeah, I'd be interested to see how they manage him the first part of the year. I mean, I wonder, being as he's a Godolphin horse and as good as he's gotten, if he would be a horse that would be considered for something like the Dubai World Cup, because he looks like he's probably Godolphin's best dirt horse. Uh, so I don't know that that's what they're going to do with him. You know, he he would, I'm, I'm sure, be spending the winter at fairgrounds. That's where his trainer, Mike Stidham, is, is based during the winter. Uh, but you know, he certainly has gotten better as he's gotten older. It'll be interesting to see if he can continue on that on that progression. I just wonder what his first quarter of the year is going to look like, being uh, that he's got Godolphin connections. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and moving on now to the older mares. Obviously, this was a, just a crazy close uh, division throughout the year. Felt and the this staff totally proved that. Uh, Malthouse one of my favorites, and I just love to hear your thoughts on. Um, her legacy uh, in, in her kind of career, and then some of the others from that distaff. That was just such a great race. Yeah, it was a great race, and it was like we were saying a little bit ago. It was probably the the best division all year long in terms of competitiveness because the the, the shows that were put on by Malathat and Clarier and the numbers of times they ran against one another. They had four meetings during the course of the year and they split them and you know, look how close they were in the breeders cup. They were two noses separated them <laughs> with blue stripe splitting them in that race. And obviously blue stripe was a, had a heck of a, a campaign with her win in the grade one Clement Hirsch at Del Mar and then a brutal beat by Malathat and the breeders cup distaff. So this to me was really one of the more interesting divisions all year. And it was funny because with the year started, I think all eyes were on Latruska and by the end of the year, she was yesterday's news. Uh, she, we were talking earlier about how, you know, how to finish off a year or whatever, but she completely went off form. And I, I don't know that she was ever the same after previous year's Breeders' Cup distaff where she got carved up on a brutally hot pace at Del Mar. I just don't know that she ever really fully bounced back from that. And it, it, it just showed in the, in I think her, her campaign in, in 2022, but this was a great division. The, the, the Ogden Phipps was a thrilling race with Clarier beating Malathat and search results running a, a monster race for third that day. Um, and you know, Pauline's Pearl was certainly a, a top horse in this division. It was just a really, fun division to, to to watch and I thought it was the, the most interesting one of all of them last year and we kind of uh, you kind of referenced this uh, at the beginning of the the show with uh, Jackie's Warrior Jay and I, I'll have to you know give both of you guys a chance to to weigh in on this because I know Eric and I haven't really talked uh, too much about this division uh, in, in our conversations but it's a very I, I feel like this is a, an Eclipse Award division where there's no good options in terms of you know you you'd love to have that horse that is totally deserving of the award because if you look at the first half of the year jackie's warrior obviously wins decisively the first half and uh elite power wins decisively the second half of the year but you know i i feel like you're kind of balancing um whether or not you want to give um the horse an elite power largely based on the breeders cup or reward jackie's warrior for work as a whole but 
Uh, certainly there were, uh, he left a lot to be desired in his last couple of races, uh, toward the end of the year. So, uh, I'll have to get both of your thoughts on this. Uh, so Jay, uh, I, I just where you're, where you're standing on this division. Yeah, this was, this was a really hard one for me to, to evaluate when I was looking at the Eclipse Awards, because as we were just talking earlier, you know, Jackie's warrior certainly was on appearances was the best horse in the division. The, the first part of the year, I thought got beat on the square in the forego by Cody's wish, and then certainly got beat in the Breeders' Cup sprint by Elite Power. And, you know, CZ Rocket finished second in that race, and I don't know that anybody was confusing CZ Rocket with one of the divisional leaders all year long. Uh, so I just don't know how, how strong that race really was. And then, more importantly for Jackie's Warrior, when you start to do a, a deeper dive of who he was beating and some of his wins the first part of the year those races just really didn't hold up the churchill downs for instance he beat seven horses reinvestment risk was second in that race aloha west was third aloha west didn't run again for seven more months and was awful uh you know, the vanderbilt he beats knee deep in snow and willie boy who was again in another small field that again, those are horses that nobody's confusing with potential divisional leaders so that when you do kind of a deeper dive as to what Jackie's warrior was accomplishing, it's just not quite as impressive as they appeared to be. At least certainly visually they were impressive, but they just aren't as impressive as when you go back and evaluate them. And like we were saying, he didn't finish the year off, but then your other candidates here are elite power who only ran in two stakes races the whole year and certainly got better as the year got on. And, and the, to me, the biggest uh, feather in his cap is that he won the championship race of the division, the Breeders' Cup Sprint. But can you give it to him off that alone? And then I, I think you can really make a legitimate case if you want to for Cody's Wish, who only ran in one you know pure sprint, that being the four ago. But he beat Jackie's Warrior that day. He won two other races around one turn. They were mile races, but they were one turn races: the Westchester and then that Hanshin at Churchill Downs. And then certainly the Breeders' Cup Mile doesn't dirt mile doesn't count towards a sprint title but if you're just looking at sort of his overall body of work and saying boy is this a horse who might be deserving of a championship you give him a little bit of a longer look so it's a it's a really tough division those to me are the top three i just don't know how the voters are gonna end up deciding here because there's like you said jack i think very accurately there's just really no good choice here that you really feel warm and fuzzy about and, and I'm definitely in the same boat, especially when we talk about Jackie's Warrior. I've kind of always been of the opinion, as brilliant as he's been individually, uh, the quality of competition has never really stood up. And I think when we look through the PPs and look at the horses he's beat this year alone, uh, you mentioned him, Aloha West. Uh, the, the, he did not have a good year. He won, uh, won a listed overnight stakes at Churchill, and, and that was really it. And, and some other okay performances outside of that. Uh, so I would definitely agree that the Bill Mott duo of Elite Power and Cody's Wish are, in my eyes, far and away the top two, and I, I think it'd be hard to make a case. I would only go Elite Power because of the Breeders' Cup sprint. And, and this is, once again, where I have trouble with the Eclipse Awards, where it feels like the Breeders' Cup sometimes matters as you win that, you win the award, um, and other times maybe not so much. And, and I could see it going either way, but I think having that true sprint win while, you know, Cody's Wish had it win against the same exact horse that we're kind of using as the benchmark. Uh, he still did beat plenty of other stakes and graded stakes winners sprinting uh, in that sprint field. A much better field, I think, uh, as a whole when you compare it to the forego. So that's why I go elite power, but I, I don't think he has much else going for him outside of that because the Vosberg, of course, uh, didn't have anything going for it. Uh, a, a very compelling debate that honestly I could see go in any way, but if it was me personally, I would lean elite power. And a personal question that just came to my mind, uh, can, comparison that I was sort of making throughout the year uh, was looking at Jackie's Warrior and comparing him to a horse from the 1980s uh, in Groovy. And just, it came to my mind, and I, I thought, Jay, I'd ask you, because I'm sure you saw Groovy on, a, on more than a couple of occasions. Uh, how, how would you compare, could you compare Jackie's Warrior to Groovy? Is that a fair um, way to look at those horses? And I, I think it's certainly in terms of the fact that these were both um, very fast, very talented sprinters who never did get a grade one. But do you see any similarities uh, just overall in the in terms of the careers that that these those two horses had uh, between those two, 
Well, not having, you know, uh, Groovy's PPs right in front of me when you're asking this question, it's kind of an impossible thing to just answer off the top of my head. <laughs> um, you know, uh, you know, his, uh, just I'm looking at his stuff right now, though. Uh, you know, in, in point of fact, I mean, this is a horse who finished second in his last race. That was the Breeders' Cup Sprint at Hollywood Park, and that was against Barry Subtle. He won the Vosburgh prior to that. He won the Florida. He won the Tom Fool. Uh, you know, he had a, a, a great year uh, in in '87. He won every race at the Breeders' Cup, and he only got beat by a horse who freaked over her home racetrack. So, I would actually say that I think, on balance, you know, Groovy is is a superior sprinter to to Jackie's Warrior. Um, and I I don't know. I wouldn't say that their careers really. Uh, track similarly so um that's that's where i would come down on this and uh we got one more division to get to uh for for the dirt uh, dirt horses and that is uh the female sprinters this one's kind of uh pretty cut and dry in terms of uh even even though um good night olive only ran in uh two sprint races uh they were both uh grade ones and they were both very strong victories for her so obviously uh getting into she's a horse that's going to come back next year so uh just your thoughts on good night olive and then uh echo zulu who uh kind of had an abbreviated campaign unfortunately because of injury but uh ran a very solid runner-up effort there and uh just where this division stands going into next year because i think uh it's certainly an exciting one which um the sprint division is or the female sprinters have kind of needed a a rejuvenation quality, which I think they're really getting um, with the horses that will be coming back for 2023. Yeah. I mean, it looks like at the least the, the top three out of the Philly and Mare sprint are going to come back next year. And that's, that's a great starting point. Um, you know, CC's who finished fourth has been retired and she was the champion the, the prior year and, and a deserving one, but you know, I, I think just right off the bat to get the top three who finished uh, in, in the Breeders' Cup Philly and Mare Sprint to stay in training is makes this potentially an exciting division. And then you know, perhaps there'll be some uh, two-year-olds turning three who by the end of the year, uh, their connections have come to realize, uh, like they did with Echo Zoo, that maybe uh, – two turns is not what they want. And, and by then you reorient them the second half of the year for a sprint campaign and, and you end up with uh, a brilliant sprinter. So this looks like it has the potential to be a, a very good division, but good night. Olive was certainly the deserving champion. She won all four of her starts. She won the ballerina uh, against top contenders in the division. And then obviously beat pretty much anybody who you would have wanted to make a, uh, a campaign for, uh, for, for having, claim potentially on the divisional title uh, was in that Breeders' Cup Philly and Mare Sprint with maybe the exception being Kamari uh, who ran against the boys instead but you know Goodnight All won the race and, and won it emphatically and she is unquestionably the, the, the right horse to vote for in this division. All right. Well, uh, I think that's pretty much it with our uh, Eclipse Award discussions with that. So obviously, uh, thank you for your time, Jay. I always love to be able to get you to come on here. And I was certainly very glad to be able to include Eric in our little roundtable discussion that we had here. No, it's my pleasure. It's good being with you guys as always.